if uh, members would be kind enough to take their seats. Thank you. Um, I'll call to order the uh, council meeting for the Regional Municipality Appeal for May the 12th, 2016. Uh, roll call. Um, all are present except Mayor Jeffrey and I uh, know Councilor Raz is on a personal matter. Uh, are there any declarations of conflicts of interest? Uh, seeing none then, uh, approval of the minutes. Moved by Councilor Kovac, seconded by uh, Councilor Mahoney. All in favor? Carried. Uh, approval of the agenda. Uh, Councilor Sado. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would like to add on to the agenda an in-camera item that is related to a personal matter um, about an identifiable individual. If I got that word incorrect. Uh, we will we'll do that. Um, any other amendments or additions? Uh, I do have a, a motion then moved by Councillor Yanika, seconded by Councillor Parrish, that the agenda for the May 12, 2016 Regional Council meeting include an additional delegation request from Warren Edwards resident regarding mental health to be dealt with under other business item 12.3, and further that the agenda for the May 12, 2016 Regional Council meeting include an additional item regarding membership of the Growth Management Committee, committee to be dealt with under other business item 12.4, and I guess we'd add Councillor Sato's uh, request as well. And further, that the agenda for the May 12, 2016 Regional Council meeting be approved as amended. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. Thank you. Um, before we move on, I, I wish to take a few moments uh, at the outset to report on a meeting that was held on May the 2nd with the Honourable Stephen Del Duca, Ontario Minister of Transportation. Um, attending that meeting on behalf of this council, uh, were Mayor Crombie, Mayor Jeffrey, Mayor Thompson, and me. Um, it is in the content of that meeting and my follow-up letter to, w to him, which is included in your agenda packages, that I would like to report on. Um, this meeting was in response to a council resolution passed in January authorizing the chair and the mayors of the Peel region to pursue the convening of this meeting. Um, furthermore, the, the objective of the meeting, as per the terms of council resolution, would be to discuss with the minister a decision made by the ministry to suspend, pending a review, the second phase of the environmental assessment regarding the proposed GTA West Corridor. Uh, the merits of this project are something that is well known to members of this council. Um, needless to say, the aforementioned Ministry of Transportation decision was something we, we received with great concern. Um, our objective going in was to impress upon the Minister the importance of resuming the EA. Um, at the time of the decision to susp suspend last December, the Minister indicated that any subsequent decisions regarding a resumption of the EA would occur in the spring. However, his most recent comments on the issue appeared to signal a delay in his deliberations. Um, I witnessed the Minister reaffirm this perspective Tuesday when he responded to a media question posed to him at the provincial land use announcement in Port Credit. Uh, when asked about the future of the proposed GTA West Corridor, the Minister stated any announcement would follow the completion of the review. Uh, furthermore, no timeline was offered. Uh, the Peel Region delegation used the meeting opportunity to inventory the merits of the GTA West project, not just to Peel Region, but in the interests of the Ontario economy as a whole and stress the investment that has already been made in the planning and information gathering process. Uh, despite what we considered being an effective presentation on our part, uh, the Minister remained non-committal. Uh, in responding, the Minister spoke to what he referred as a holistic approach to transportation planning. Uh, we assured the Minister that this project was being contemplated in a reasonable way and was by no means in conflict with the transportation planning procedure uh, he was advocating. Uh, following the meeting, I felt it would be helpful to send the Minister a thank you letter and use the opportunity to reiterate some of the points we made in the meeting and more importantly, further emphasize that what we are advocating by no means conflicts with responsible, inclusive and fact-based transportation and development planning. 
For example, all of us familiar with the Peel Goods Movement Task Force are aware of the broad-based composition of its membership and the extent to which regional staff ensure that all transportation perspectives are represented. Uh, in my capacity as a participant in the external meetings of the task force, I recently had a further opportunity to experience this constructive exchange of ideas and perspective firsthand. Uh, I would just say that uh, before we conclude on this topic, uh, perhaps the mayors may have something to add. If not, okay. Uh, Mayor Thompson. I have to proudly say that uh, Chair Dale, you did a terrific job that day. And uh, thank you for following up with the letter and your letter of what you articulated, I think, uh, is addressed with the issues. And uh, all we can do is uh, keep driving what you've put in that letter forward as we go forward. I can understand part of his reasoning why he wants to wait till fall, but I think there's a lot of other things more than just planning that has to deal with it. We're talking about economics as well, and I think you addressed that quite well <coughs> in Toronto. Um, um, my letter's reference is 9.6, and yeah. maybe we could just bring that forward now. If you I'll do, gladly move it. We okay. receive to that. Second by Councillor Starr. All in favour then? Carry. Thank you very much. Um, that moves us into items related to human services. Uh, if Councillor Miles would kindly chair this section. Oh, you know what? There's, There's nothing. nothing. Yeah. That was really easy for you. <laughs> okay. Thank, thanks for all your support and help with that. Um, yeah. Items related to enterprise programs and services. You don't get off as easy, Councillor Fonseca. So. Thank we'll you, Mr. You. Chair. Um, items related to enterprise programs and services. Uh, item 7.1 is a tax capping policy selection of options. And in the recommendation, the region is recommending that we continue the application of all optional tools, including the new enhancements as a fair means of moving properties in the cap property classes toward full current value assessment tax levels. That's in the bullets in the report highlights. Seeing no comments on the board, moved by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Mayor Jeffrey. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Item 7.2 is a proposed transfer of permanent easements. This is for um, <coughs> wards, Ward 9 in the City of Brampton. No questions. Moved by Councillor Sprovieri. Seconded by Councillor Pileschi. All in favour? Any opposed? Carried. Item 7.3 is the recommendation of... This is for a... Um, an automated vehicle locator and telematics platform to be awarded to Ferno Ace Tech Canada and the estimated amount of 850000 in accordance with the purchasing bylaw. Seeing no questions, moved by Councillor Starr, seconded by Councillor Moore. All in favour? Any opposed? Carried. Item 7.4 is the report of the Lobby Registry, Registry and Integrity Commissioner. Seeing no questions, moved by uh, Councillor Mahoney, seconded by Councillor Pileschi. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, item 7.5 is the minutes to report of the Region of Peel Accessibility Advisory Committee, moved by Councillor Groves, seconded by Councillor Mahoney. All in favour? Any opposed? <coughs> Carried. Item 7.6 is the report of the Governance Review Task Force. <coughs> Seeing no questions, moved by Mayor Crombie, seconded by Mayor Thompson. All in favour? Any opposed? Carried. Um, item 7.7, .7, this is an added item. It's um, an update on the uh, Region of Peel's uh, participation in drafting of Ontario culture strategy. Seeing no questions, moved by Councillor McFadden, seconded by Councillor Madero. So all in favour? Any opposed? Carried. And another added item, item 7.8, is correspondence from MPP Sylvia Jones. And this is with regards to making sure that we are aware that the nominations for the Ontario Senior Achievement Award are now open. Move Moved by Councillor Tovey, seconded by Councillor Starr. All in favour? Any opposed? Carried. 
And I believe that's back to you, Mr. Chair. Well done. That was quick. Um, <laughs> items related to public works, uh, Councillor Starr, if you chair this section, please. Oh. Actually, uh, Councillor, say is that in relation to? Yeah. Oh. Okay, we can go back to that. Yes. Oh. Sorry, if I could just ask a question. The report from the uh, the governance task force is not from the most recent meeting, correct? It was an earlier meeting. There was a meeting on April 28th. Why would those minutes not be on here? It is from the 28th. Okay, maybe I'm looking at the wrong page because my mine says the mine's from the one before. Yeah. So. Mine's not from the 28th. <laughs> it's the March. The ones that are in my my agenda are from March. Here's two. Right? Yeah. It's March 31st minutes. So there's a dish additional minutes or a report that should be attached from the last meeting? Yeah, I don't I'll, have I'll double addition. check and, and uh, recirculate, mm -hmm. but it is from the, the actual report, is the presentation from the facilitator from the 28th. Okay, the, what so I have is the report from March 31st, his presentation, and the minutes from March 31st that says the next meeting will be April 28th, but I have nothing for on the April 28th. In, in my agenda. Uh, I'll look in and recirculate them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Um, Councillor Starr then, with Public Works. Okay, the uh, first item 8.1, and we have a presentation by staff. Gary and Rob, welcome. Good, uh, good morning, Chair Dale, members of Council. The purpose of our presentation today is to provide an overview of the report that is before you regarding the financial implications if the jurisdiction and financial responsibility for regional roads were to be transferred. Uh, Chair Dale, we recognize there are a lot of content in this presentation. Rob and I would be pleased to uh, take questions of clarification at the end of each slide or at the end of the presentation, whichever you prefer. So, thanks. We are here today to provide an overview of the financial implications that would be associated with jurisdictional transfer of all regional roads within the boundaries of the cities of Mississauga and Brampton. I want to point out that the financial, or the financial information that's presented today is a snapshot in time as of December 31st, 2015. As per Council's directional, re regional staff has engaged senior staff from the cities of Brampton and Mississauga to explore financial and jurisdictional implications to their respective municipalities. For completeness, the analysis includes impacts to the town of Caledon as well, and regional staff have had conversations with Caledon's staff regarding this matter. Specifically today, we're going to be reviewing the impacts associated with the 10-year capital plan, the reserve funds and balances, capital projects that are already in progress, and the 2016 operating budget. At the end of the presentation, we'll also highlight the human resource considerations and some of the other considerations that would be associated with uh, a jurisdictional change to give Council a more complete view of the other issues that would have implications, whether they're financial or otherwise. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> the region's 10-year roads-related capital plan, which spans from 2016 to 2025, is $1.2 billion. Uh, as you can see in the chart to the left, the 10-year capital requirements for the City of Brampton is at $877 million, or 72% of the 10-year capital plan, 
Well, the capital investments in Caledon amount to 180 million, or 15 percent, and Mississauga makes up the remaining 156 million, or 13 percent. On the right of the slide, you will see the funding sources for the 10-year capital plan. As you will notice, the majority of the region's 10-year capital is funded from development charges, which is 746 million, or 61 percent of the total. This amount is expected to be recovered from development between now and 2031. 87% of the development charges resides for work completed in the city of Brampton. 8% for the city of Mississauga, while the town of Cowden makes up the remaining 5%. The second largest funding source is tax reserves, which is 391 million, or 32% of the funding source total. This amount is funded through contributions to reserves included in the annual operating budget. As outlined in the Council report, the largest component of the tax reserve funding supports road works completed in Brampton, which is $171 million, or 44% of the total tax reserve funding, while the remaining amount supports works completed in the city of Mississauga and the town of Caledon equally at approximately $110 million, or 28% each. External financing, which are largely recoveries from area municipalities or gas tax, from the province makes up the remaining balance of the 10-year capital funding program, and that's 58 million or 7%. Next, I will address the four reserves that support the road program. The first reserve is the Capital Stabilization Reserve, which is used to fund future projects that are financed from the tax base. Currently, there's 55 million available to support the 10-year capital program. The funding is $391 million, as highlighted in the previous slide. The second reserve supports winter maintenance, which funds years where winter maintenance activities result in additional maintenance or unpredictable activity um, due, due to weather events um, beyond the budgeted amounts. And as you can see, there's currently $7 million in this reserve. The remaining two reserve funds are related to development charges. The first of the two development charge reserve funds is currently underfunded by $236 million, which is expected to be fully recovered through development charge activity between now and 2031. The region has taken $14 million of debt for previously approved projects and may be required to take on additional debt to finance future growth investments. The region and area municipality DC bylaws would require amendments to reflect both changes in road ownership and recoveries of development charges in regards to this. The second development charge reserve fund relates to construction of the north-south arterial road, which is required to service future growth in northwest Brampton. This corridor is proposed to be constructed by the province as part of the GTA West corridor. Given the province's recent decision to suspend the EA for the GTA West corridor, further analysis would be required should council or the City of Brampton wish to proceed with construction of this corridor. While the chart shows $35 million is available in this reserve fund, it should be noted that the region's share of this project, uh, as per the development charge background study, is approximately $130 million. So I've just completed a review of the 10-year capital program and how that is funded, and now I'd like to provide some insights on the capital projects that are currently in process. As of December 31st, 2015, there's $269 million of remaining work to be spent on projects that have yet to be, or that are approved by council but yet to be completed. Similar to the 10-year capital plan, the current work activity is highest in the city of Brampton, which is $208 million or 78% of the total approved capital program. While the activity in Caledon, Mississauga makes up the remaining 60 million, or 22%. As time passes, these capital amounts will continuously change as work is completed and new work is added to the list. Pending Council's direction, a detailed transition plan would need to be completed to create the final listing of projects that would be transferred to any area municipality and this would assist in appropriate timing of such transfers as well. Uh, this concludes the financial implications and I'll now pass it back to Gary to talk about some of the other impacts related to the transition.
Yep. Thanks, Rob. The, uh, this table summarizes a staff complement that's currently engaged in managing and delivering the Sorry, I've missed a so Sorry, can I go back? I, I, I would like to actually highlight some of the operating impacts. Sorry, I've passed it to Gary a little prematurely. <laughs> So in this chart, uh, you will see an estimate of the $64 million in the annual operating budget for the ROGE program, and that's split down by area municipality, along with a comparison of how the budget is funded from the tax levy. For clarity, the operating budget is comprised of two key categories. The first category is the ROGE program expenditures of $33 million, or just over half of the $64 million annual operating budget. There are expenditures to support the ROGE program, such as seasonal maintenance, traffic signals, street lights, and also the infrastructure planning and design teams themselves. The second category in the operating budget is contributions to reserves, and this is 31 million, or just under half of the operating budget. As we touched on earlier, this helps fund the 10-year capital program from the tax base. Now I will pass it to you. My apologies. <coughs> Thanks, Rob. So this, this table summarizes the staff complement that's engaged in managing and delivering the transportation program. From a human resource perspective, there's 182 staff that support the roads program. 56 of those are unionized, 126 are non-unionized. Uh, we've provided a high-level breakdown of the activities that the direct and indirect staff are engaged in. For clarity, direct staff are those that exist within the transportation division, both the union and non-union staff. And the indirect staff are in support roles in other divisions or departments within Peel. The number of indirect staff was calculated based on historic activities supporting the division's functions. A pending council direction, there would be need to more fully understand the human resource impacts associated with any uh, transitional options, as well as associated costs. And there are a number of other financial or non-financial implications, but they do have financial components to them. The uh, one of them is the collective agreements with the unionized employees both in Peel and within the local municipalities, and the recognition that those agreements would have to be respected. In our discussions with the municipal staff, there were questions about space accommodation at yards for both uh, people and equipment. And there are many contracts in place for both operational activities and capital work that would be impacted and those contractual implications would have to be assessed in more detail. And finally, in, in terms of the capital program, as, as Rob mentioned, given the nature of the work, there would be need to consider sort of how and at what stages it would be appropriate to transition work and to reflect in a coordinated fashion with the local municipalities through the development charges bylaw updates. So there'd be need to really understand if it's being transitioned from a capital perspective to the area municipalities, how the development charges bylaws would be updated to recover the funds that are needed to deliver the program. And that concludes our presentation, but we would be pleased to answer any questions there might be. Okay, <coughs> questions, comments? Uh, Councilor Spilbieri. Yeah, I think, Mr. Chairman, uh, can you tell us um, how many kilometers of regional roads are in the uh, three municipalities? On aggregate, there's approximately 1,600 lane kilometers. You know, in each municipality, do you have a breakdown? Uh, I don't have a breakdown with me. No. How many? You don't have a breakdown. It's it's roughly split a third, a third, a third. It's fairly well balanced. Oh, so it is fairly balanced. So Brampton has as many many kilometers as Mississauga and Caledon, you think? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, the, the number of lane kilometers is roughly balanced between the three. Um, so, uh, so <clears throat> then why is there a difference in the uh, budget, uh, how much is spent in Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon? Uh, you showed 19.7 million in Mississauga, 26.4 million in Brampton, and 18.1 in Caledon, uh, is what you're uh, spending uh, in the various municipalities. Why is is there such a 
uh, difference between uh, the Mississauga and Brampton? You want to speak about yeah. no, start with capital? Three, yeah, three you, Mr. Chair. So the, the spending uh, includes two things, operating costs and capital costs associated with state of good repair. And essentially it reflects the fact that in Mississauga, most of the roads have been completely built out. So there isn't a lot of uh, state of good repair related capital work in the program over the, the coming years. In Brampton, there are roads that are being widened or reconstructed and there's a state of good repair component to the capital work that's being done. So that's essentially, that's what the difference is. But you also showed that most of the widenings in Brampton uh, regional roads are paid for by development charges. Um, so, so why would it show in the operating uh, budget? Uh, three, Mr. Chair. So, um, road the road widening program is essentially financed through development charges, but there's components of it that are financed through taxation. So, for example. If you're doing a four to six lane ride widening, there's a rehabilitation component to the existing four lanes, and that is typically financed through taxes. Similarly, there may be a rehabilitation com component to a, a structure, a bridge. Um, so it isn't entirely funded through development charges. Some of it is funded through taxes. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, through the chair, I, I find it interesting that the breakdown is fairly even, a third, 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 uh, right across the three municipalities. It's, uh, whether it was uh, planned that way or whether it just happened that way, um, any any comments on that, to how it happened that we have a... Uh, yeah, th three, Mr. Chair, that's, uh, that's the nature of the network. And uh, historically, it was uploaded, I guess, from the county days. And for the most part, the regional road network reflects the old county road system that was in place many years ago. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Parrish. Yes, I'd like to thank staff for doing such a thorough job. Um, our position in Mississauga is that we really would like to take over the maintenance and the control of our own roads. Um, so I have a motion here today prepared by our staff, and I think Councillor Carlson's going to speak to it because he had a meeting with them, which I was unable to attend. But uh, the clerk has a copy. We can put it up on the screen. Please don't construe this as we're taking our roads and going home. This is not a separation move. This is seriously something we've wanted to do for a long time. It's economical. It's good for our staff. It's good for us to be able to just maintain our roads and take care of them without having to account to anybody. So if this is not a backdoor move of leaving the region, that'll, that'll happen right in your face someday. But uh, that's not what we're doing. <coughs> or not. Okay. Culture Carlson. I'm assuming, Mr. Chair, that people wouldn't want to take a minute to read it. I'm, I don't know. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, sorry, but uh, skipping to yeah, attorney okay. there. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> yeah. Just for clarification, uh, may, maybe uh, staff, maybe you can tell us how, how long has this process been going on with respect to the possibility of taking the roads over? The most, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the most recent process has been going on since I believe 2006. Um, the the ARAS process that recommended the ultimate option 4A for uploading and downloading commenced in about 2009. So it's, it's been going on for quite some time. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Collison, uh, do you want to? I'm next on the list, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I just know that he flipped off, so you're no, okay? I, that was actually, <coughs> I, can speak to, I can speak to it now. I've just accidentally, I didn't want to leave my mic on, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> While people were talking. Yeah, sure, speak, to, yeah. Well, it's very, uh, quite simple in that, uh, I th in a maturing city like Mississauga where the capital side is kind of more or less taken care of and we're now more <coughs> into the maintenance mode, it makes some sense operationally for us to have the total picture under control of the city of Mississauga and there'll be some efficiencies in operation in terms of the maintenance and uh, improvements of the regional roads. Uh, it's not really clear in this uh, motion, at least I don't think it is, that uh, we'd still continue to pay the regional share of all the, uh, the other municipalities. It's basically, we look after our own, 
uh, side of things and we'll still be a participant. We're not taking the regional money away from the other municipalities, which I think was always kind of the, the, the concern with, uh, with the rest of council and the rest of the, both the other municipalities. So it's here as a notice of motion, I assume. So I don't, I'm to you, Mr. Chair, I don't suppose we could settle it all today. No, nope. what says notice of motion on it, right? <coughs> it says draft anyway. Yeah, it does but say it, notice of ours. Yes, yeah, so it, I mean, your hands is whether you, everyone thinks they have enough uh, information today, but that's clearly the position of Mississauga that going forward we'd like to maintain control of our own roads. And as explained to us by our senior staff, uh, there's some internal efficiency that, as we all know, there's a lot of back and forth and to and fro and consulting between the region <coughs> and the city. And really, we're in a maintenance mode, more or less. So kind of makes sense. I'm sure those councillors that have tried to unravel the difference between a regional road, a city road, who's in charge of what, uh, there's a not calculable amount of time and money put into that process. So we're thinking that uh, we could actually, internal efficiency will save money in the long run. So that's kind of the, the basic uh, premise that was given to us yesterday. And uh, I'm sure there'll be time to step. We'll need to report back and some assurances about staffing and so on, that sort of thing. We don't want to uh, put anybody out of a job or that sort of stuff. So I'll leave it at that for now. Looking at that list of speakers, I better cede uh, the, uh, the the podium. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, on a point of order. Say notice of motion. Is it clear that it's a notice of motion to be? Re Okay. Okay. I, I just so we're, thank you. I think for clarification for uh, the rest of council and staff, I think the last line explains exactly. I think what the intent is is to engage the city uh, staff to develop a implement a implementation plan, basically, and I guess get all the information. Is that what the intent? Actually, Councillor Starr, if I could just clarify to Councillor Anika's point, uh, procedurally, th th it's not a notice of motion. It is a motion pertaining to this item. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, before we go any further with all of the legal stuff, why don't we listen to everybody? Uh, Councillor Medeiros. No, I'm next. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Sprovieri. Oh, you forget about your neighbor, right? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, um, well, um, it's an interesting uh, proposition for sure. Uh, although, I, the first reaction I got is how generous Ms. Saga is. Yeah. Um, but then I also been reading in a paper that uh, Ms. Saga is uh, considering breaking up because uh, Ms. Saga is putting more into the pool, uh, regional pool. And this, <clears throat> if uh, this goes through, uh, it's only going to make it even more, um, uh, it's going to create, it's going to amplify the, the issue even more. There's going to be even more uh, uh, Ms. Saga money going into the regional pool, which you don't really receive a, a benefit from. And so that's kind of contradictory to um, to me. It sounds like it's very contradictory to why Ms. Saga would want to take over regional roads when it's going to increase the cost to maintain, to maintain these roads, and it's going to and Ms. Saga is still going to be required to put uh, keep uh, putting more money into the pool uh, to look after Brampton's and Caledon's regional roads. So there's kind of a contradiction there, and uh, from the way I read it, so, but. You know, if Ms. Saga wants to be that generous, and uh, I, I'm, it's okay with me, I don't have a problem with that. But uh, I just hope that you don't come back later and say, well, you know, we did the math, and now look at all the money we're putting into the uh, pool, and we're not getting the benefits. So I, I think this is where we're uh, headed for. And uh, so certainly, I, you know, I, if I were a Ms. Saga counselor, I'd be, uh, unless there was a way that, um, you had a, a reassurance from the province that you were that they're going to be uh, open to uh, the breakup of the region. Then fine, but you know uh, until that happens, I think this is very contrary to uh, what Ms. Saga has been after all these years. So uh, those are my comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Maybe uh, we need clarification of the motion, the last line again. It is for consideration of all the ramifications, all the financials, all the details. Is that right? 
That's yeah. what I was asking for. Okay, so you know, we're not we're not asking for any uh, transfer of roads today. Anything happening there? Anyway, okay, we'll move on to uh, Councillor Maderos. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, I appreciate uh, the spirit and the motion, the intent, and thank you, uh, Councillor Parrish, for uh, the explanation that simply it's uh, about getting a staff report. I know at the City of Brampton, our staff has taken the position um, similar of uh, us uh, uh, taking over the maintenance and then after through some form of transfer payment, I also do similar. I just think that in Mississauga, if Brampton's thinking the same thing about doing it, um, I would like to move a, a motion of referral so then uh, that we can come back and consult with our Brampton staff and after maybe come with the unified motion where uh, talks would include the city of Brampton and Mississauga at the same time with regional staff instead of doing it in isolation. So I'd like to put the uh, motion of referral. What takes precedent? Referral. Do you mean def deferral, Councillor Medeiros? Uh, referral. Re referring it to? To Mrs. To Brampton staff, or defer it to give your staff an opportunity. So defer it to give Def more staff opportunity. Then <laughs> people can't speak to it. Okay. So you want to, you want to hold that motion in the first? No, we'll hold speak? it for a referral then. Please refer it back to staff. Okay. To the Miss Powell's. I appreciate the lesson. Okay, Councillor Shaughnessy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I look at this and I, I, I truly think that uh, our staff here outlined a couple of necessary steps prior to us moving forward. And I would just like them to articulate once again, they, they talked about more, they need to do, do more financial background either through human resources and a number of what could you just outline what you think needs to be done from a regional perspective because as I sit here I'm 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 here as the regional councillor to support my region and I would like to know what my region thinks they need to do before we move forward so could you just outline that please surely through you mr. chair the uh I mean, quite, quite simply, the report before you presents the financial information, a snapshot in time as of December 31st of last year. So it presents what um, the financial, sort of the impacts associated with the operating budget, the capital budget, and the capital work in progress. It doesn't get into any details in terms of space accommodation. So it doesn't get into, is there, you know, yards uh, able to accommodate the additional staff and equipment? is um, what are the nuances of the collective agreements associated with transferring bodies, you know, especially for the unionized employees, and, and how do we handle things like uh, aligning the development charges background studies if you're actually moving capital projects from, you know, the authority or responsibility of one municipality to another. So there's a lot of details, and I think the motion speaks to it. There's a lot of things that would have to be discussed and analyzed and come back with a specific um, approach or sort of detailed work plan in, t in terms of how this would be addressed. You know, it's, it's probably not quite as, as simple as just uh, transferring it. There's a lot of work that has to go into figuring out the details in terms of how you would do it. Um, you mentioned a snapshot in time. If we'd gone back 10, 15, 20 years, uh, would the balance be different? So you're saying, I'm assuming you just looked at this past year and moving forward for that 10 year period, what would have happened the 10 years back? So, so we didn't look at other snapshots in time over a period, uh, but as we mentioned, you know, every week um, things change as capital projects are completed or added to the program. It's a constant evolution of uh, where money is being invested uh, across the region, and it's it's going to constantly change. And as, I, as I think we did mention, a lot of the the infrastructure in Mississauga has has been built. The attention of the growth-related capital program for the next little while is largely in Brampton. So Just because that's where the nature of development is. Thank Excuse you. Me. So the uh, what came down from the province just recently on the four plan review and uh, the announcements the other day, would that have an effect on uh, on 
the future, both in all municipalities? Do you think this, this will have a great effect to how we, hand, how we handle this? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's, that's just coming out. I think that is something that's going to take some time to analyze and digest, but it's certainly impactful in terms of the way we grow. Okay. D um, just one more question. Did we need this motion here to get the region to do this work? Um, I, I, I worry when I see a motion that's like this long. If it was just a motion to investigate uh, what else is important to the region in moving forward? It could be done in a paragraph, and when I see something this long, I get a little antsy. So, <laughs> did we actually need this long, complicated? Through the chair, I think the challenge. So, so for the last motion that was passed, we've had a couple of meetings with staff from Brampton and Mississauga. Good productive meetings, but I think the challenge, the fundamental challenge, is understanding exactly what is being asked. There's all kinds of, you know, different combinations or approaches that could be used for um, disentanglement, and for uh, teams on either side, uh, either the local folks or regional folks, to move <coughs> this forward. There needs to be clarity in terms of what the direction council wants, so that we can actually focus our energies on um, identifying a work plan that responds to that direction. But when it's fairly open, um, it does it does take a lot of energy, and there's so many options that are out there. So what the additional direction is helpful in terms of focusing the conversations going forward. What would be even more helpful, we need to understand what the timelines um, Council may be looking for in terms of response or making changes so that, again, we can all work towards those um, timelines and respond back accordingly. Oh, well, that's enough for me. There's a number of people on the board, and I'll let others ask questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just for clarification, are we speaking to the referral or are we speaking to this motion? Well, we, we heard the report, so we're speaking to basically everything. There's a referral, so the referral no, no, would... Been held. It's been held. Oh, we're holding, okay. Um, well, I don't have anything to say with respect to the motion. I wanted to speak to the referral. So I guess I will get off the board and come back on. Uh, how, how do you want me to go? Okay, I'm going to speak. Speak to okay. the referral. All right. In speaking to the referral, I do support the referral. Happy to second the referral because I think we all, I think it needs to go back through all three municipalities because we do need to know the impacts that it will have on, on each municipality. So, um, and, and, and in with, with respect to the question that Councillor Shaughnessy asked, I think that that's a pretty important question because we do have a roads review program or we have something going on currently Gary and you can correct me if I'm wrong I mean, is that correct yeah so through you mr. chair there was what was referred to as a RASP, the arterial road rationalization study that was done uh, completed a few years ago and we've been working through council direction to implement that so there has been an upload of Coleraine Drive in Caledon and Brampton there has been discussions about sidewalks and multi-use paths and different things so um, we've been going down that path and this would be a you know definitely a deviation from the previous direction of council right and thank you and that's why I think I support that referral because I think we need to sort of carry on through that path as, as the direction from Council because this is sort of contradictory to, to that committee. So I will second that referral. Mayor Jeffrey. Well, I appreciate Councillor Parrish's calming um, preamble, um, but I read the words ultimately supporting the transfer of jurisdictional financial responsibility and that's kind of what stands out to me. This is um, a very complex issue, and I remember going to the workshop, and um, although there were many issues that we shared in common, we have a lot of differences in where we are as, as communities, and I appreciate that it's um, 
It's maintenance for Mississauga. It isn't for Brampton. And we've been part of the region for a long time, investing into this institution and into this region because that was part of our responsibility. And now as, as we are in a high growth uh, period of Brampton's future and, and as things are changing around us, whether it's provincial decisions or otherwise, um, this has a huge financial impact on Brampton and certainly the region. So I'm unprepared to support it today. I'm not sure I will in the future unless I have more information. So I feel um, it's still being worked on at a staff level. It is complex and, I, and we have not come to a, a solution. So at this point, it, it's, it's premature to uh, send staff off to, uh, to find a plan that uh, makes a transfer happen, particularly when I believe this motion hasn't been ratified in Mississauga. So I think I understand it's still in the, in the formation process, but if, it, if at the end of the day they're still not at that table, I think it's premature and I'm happy to support a referral. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mayor Thompson. <clears throat> well, since I've been on here as a regional councillor too since 2006 with the ERASC, there's one thing here that I see is missing. Um, I see maintenance and everything's come into play. But the biggest uh, discussion that's always been about is the limited points of access for our businesses on regional roads. That's been what the, basically started the talking of all of this in the first place. And I don't see that being addressed. And that's a real issue. You're right, uh, uh, Councillor Sato, it, it, it is planning, but I think that needs to be added in. I, I'll support the referral, but I think that is something that needs to be discussed because that's been the big, this is what initiated this all in the first place. So how about we uh, address that as well? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Parrish. Well, under old lessons relearned, when I was a brand new councillor, I came up here and I think my second meeting, Hazel wandered over here with a motion in her hand and gave it to me and she said, would you move this? I said, sure. And I moved it. I didn't understand it. I didn't know anything about it. Nobody had prepared me for it. I was going to be prepared for this and I had a dog that was barfing all over my house, so I missed the meeting. Second lesson we learned is if you miss the meeting, you hand the motion to Councillor Carlson who went to that meeting and you let him stick handle it. <laughs> my third impression, just so everybody knows what I'm thinking, is I am fairly convinced and I don't think I'll be disagreed with by our staff that we want to continue the obligation of paving your roads in Brampton. You paved ours, we'll pave yours. I think what we're looking for, or what our staff is looking for, is complete control over maintenance and transfer of payments back to Mississauga just for the maintenance portion of it. That's my understanding of it, but I could be totally wrong. So I would be happy to have this referred. I would be happy to have the staff explain to me why I got into this pickle. And I would be happy to have George Carlson try to get me out of it, because he's the smartest guy on the face of the earth. But I'm supporting you, Martin. And screw it. Well, with that, this is a historic day. Councillor Parrish is happy. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Carlson. So it's also a start for the reason she finally admitted I might be smarter than her. Was. So anyway, uh, it, it doesn't have to be more confusing than it already is. Uh, sending this back for referral is, is an excellent idea. <clears throat> the uh, uh, Some confusion about the tax. What was <coughs> simply happened is the portion of the regional taxes that, uh, that comes from uh, Mississauga or to the region for the, our contribution would now be taxed at the city level. So with the regional budget, there are not going to be two taxes here. <coughs> the money will be spent in Mississauga from Mississauga taxpayers and reduced from the regional budget. However, the city of Mississauga will still contribute to its normal contribution to all the work that's being done in Brampton and Calvin. As I said earlier, it's an operational improvement in that we'll be able to run the whole system in Mississauga from however many yards we run it from currently, and there'll be some, over time, some saving in that regard. So, but there's no problem sending it, to, uh, moving it down the line. It just, it needs to keep moving in the process, that's all, and uh, to have Brampton look at it and come back for a report here. Uh, the question I raised yesterday was a lot about the staffing, like we don't want to create, you know, uh, any uh, you know misunderstanding with all the staff at the region and you know job losses that sort of thing that was the number one question that we had but given that we're in the maintenance mode 
and we have few regional roads, it just makes sense to add it to, to the fleet as opposed to continually back and forth with the region over who's doing what to which road. So it's a fairly straightforward uh, uh, concept, but I don't, uh, you know, Councillor Parrish's dog, uh, dog eater homework, I guess. So I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. So thanks very much, Mr. Councillor Sato. Thank you. Every time this comes up, I kind of cringe because I, I chaired the IRS committee since 2006 until I finally said enough is enough. Um, and the number of times I'm sure the clerk could go back through the records and look at the number of times that this almost identical motion has been before us, before the committee, um, and has been referred back for more information and more information and more information. Um, it, it's, you know, it, every, you um, my colleague here asked about if you took another snapshot in time, what would it look like? Well, I think every snapshot in time, you go back every couple of years, is going to look differently. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think what, what was coming out of the IRS committee, and I'm not sure that it, it is very clear here, is that um, all Mississauga was asking for was the authority to take over the roads. Um, we would, there would be no changes in the tax except that it would be um, reproportioned. And the same as we're doing with the traffic signal operation, where um, we're still paying, it's still coming out of regional taxes, but our staff would be uh, doing the work and making the decisions on the roads. And over the years, Brampton has said that they wanted the same thing. Those members that sat around the, uh, the committee meeting, that they wanted control of the roads. And you're right, Councillor, uh, sorry, Mayor, um, the, uh, Mayor Thompson, the um, issue of planning is what started the whole thing, is that we wanted to have the decision making as to what happened with those driveways and access onto our local roads. So, you know, the, I, th I think the motion makes it sound worse than it actually yeah. is. So I, I fully support the referral because I think it has to come back um, laying it out clearly. Every time we sent staff, we had a, we had a t staff task force on ARASC, and every time we sent them away, they would come back and Brampton and Mississauga together had one opinion and regional staff had another opinion. And we never see, every time they went away, it was, you know, Dan, you, you, you've been involved in that for all these years. So it, it's come down to the point where council has to make the decision because we've been hearing from the staff from all these times. But I think we just need more details on exactly what we are asking for. So um, I guess the motion could have been a lot, more, a lot clearer in that. But referring it isn't going to make uh, a big deal of difference in, in the timing of it. So I'm fully supportive of Councilor Madero's uh, recommendation to do that. Maybe we can hear from uh, Dan. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, Gary's uh, done a great job. I think the only thing we would uh, ask, uh, going back, circulating before you know coming back to us, is putting the rigor of timelines into this motion. Uh, the only reason we're meeting with you today is three months ago, Councillor Parris said, I want the report in three months. And that timeline forced the rigor and discipline to bring this back forward. Without a timeline, we will be having this conversation, I suspect, in the next term of council. Um, and one of the, the second parts, so report back, you know, when you want us to report back, you know, that, that's one piece. I think the, the one key point is, if we're going to do anything, what's the hypothetical date of change? Because that drives then all the work plans. And we can just debate forever about things and I think as Gary pointed out every day a new capital project comes on one comes off now that everything changes again so we do need to work to timelines and we're we're very willing to work with with the municipalities we have on this report uh, we provided everything that you've asked for us and we'll continue to work and follow your direction but timelines will bring some discipline to it Councilor Tovey Yes, thank you very much. I fully support the, the referral. I think this is a good idea to have a look at. Uh, one, I, I assume that one of the things we'll be looking at would have to be uh, how we control the easements on the, on the, on the regional roads, because we have so many water and sewer 
pipes underneath the ground, particularly down in Mississauga, and I think that that could be a huge issue as far as transferring the maintenance. Uh, so yeah, I'd be looking at that. I guess uh, just a question to staff, what would be a reasonable amount of time where you think you could accomplish that, this type of gargantuan task of bringing us a report back? <coughs> what would be what would be reasonable? October, September, or maybe. Could, could I try to address that? It, it really is one that we would have to know what the scope of the work is with with the municipal staff. Uh, corporate restructurings can be done in a week. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do collective bargaining in weeks. Um, but if you need all parties to be at the same table at the same timeline, so. We'll meet whatever timeline you provide us, but we have to work with uh, our colleagues at the, at the two cities. So, and I can't speak for them. Hmm. Is there a suggestion? Maybe I don't know. September. September. I don't count from there, or maybe through, October. Through the chair. Through the chair. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Commissioner Lebrecht, where my staff is suggesting, staff from the city is suggesting minimum six months that we, yeah. we require. Yeah. So, so if October. that's, if that'd be fine. Yeah. So October. And would it, be, would it be helpful to this report if we were to add something in it about direction of people uh, from Brampton, Caledon and Mississauga staffs cooperating in a timely manner? Yeah. I think that's given. They've been working on it. Yeah. The, just our staff can all take direction on that, I would hope. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The uh, the board is clear, and um, we have a motion, uh, Council Medeiros. My apo my apologies. Uh, just through uh, through the chair, um, I would really want. I'm I'm really concerned about the 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 job impact, the employment impact. So if if we can really understand the, the the implications of be it with the collective bargaining etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think that work really has to be looked at in a, a very thoughtful manner because I'd uh, I'm really concerned about that aspect so I'd really uh, appreciate if we can really put a focus on on uh, on that thank you okay we have a motion of referral from uh, Councillor Maderos and uh, Mayor Jeffrey uh, all in favor and uh, Councillor Groves Groves Groves, Groves. Groves Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure. Okay, that's fine. We'll change that. Councilor Groves. Councilor Groves. You're so noted. <laughs> All in favor? Those opposed? Carried. Okay. Councilor Good discussion. Stur Good discussion. Thank you. Councilor Starr, just for, for clarification, it's a referral to report back on the discussions at the area um, municipalities by October. That was the that's time. That's what I understand. Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll just get the date. Thank you. Or sooner. Uh, okay, the next uh, item we have on the board is uh, the final, let me just check this, make sure. Final settlement, widening of the road, 8 Door Road, City of Brampton, Ward 10, is that yours? Yeah. You want to speak to that? No? Move it? Yeah, I'll move it. Move, it, move that Councilor Sproveri, seconded by Councilor Groves, <coughs> all in favor? Carried. Update on the Bolton Expansion Regional Road Amendment Application. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Downey. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, and I'm not sure if this is relevant or not, but I'm just going to ask the question. <coughs> um, we know that something just came out about the the um, the, the ratio, 80 people. <clears throat> they're changing the green field and they're switching it around as I understand it. I don't know enough about it, but I, because it's new, but I just want to know, so we're looking at 80 people per hectare, and I, if I understand it correctly, they're talking about somehow delinking population and employment. They're talking about 60% infill, 40% green field. So my question is, how does that, does that have any bearings on this? I, I had. So through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, places to grow, um, the new places to grow, right. 2016 places to grow came out uh, about 48 hours ago. Uh, we're still digesting that information. There will be a report to council. The commenting period is the end of September. 
So we will be reporting to Council early September, so that gives us a lot of time to think through uh, the repercussions of all of these policy changes and what it means to planning and Peel. Um, and after the commenting period, uh, there'll be legislation and so forth. This process will continue. Uh, this process is for the 2038, the 2031A numbers, and, uh, the, uh, and the plan is to have this process before a public meeting in September and a final report by the end of the year. So this process that we're undertaking here um, is uh, separate from what's happening with Places to Grow uh, and, the, and the, the new 2016 Places to Grow, um, because at this point in time, we don't know when that legislation will come forward and what those changes will even look like. This is just uh, a dis uh, a proposed policies for discussion. Okay, just wanted to know that. And Arvin, I thought the public meeting was gonna be in June. That, that was my understanding. Uh, we are working uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to Councillor Groves. We are working uh, as per the timelines that are part of the facilitation, which was to prepare a draft regional official plan amendment in June. And we'll, we'll bring that to you. And at that point, we need your authorization to hold a public meeting. We hope you'll also authorize us to do a, a public open house so we can get some good input and uh, that so you know you don't want to schedule that over the summer months right so we will do that in early september, september. okay thank you okay we'll uh, have it moved by councillor grove seconded by councillor downey all in favor carried lakeview waterfront connection ward one yeah. moved by councillor tovey seconded by councillor mahoney all in favor Carried uh, 8.5 engineering services for Lauren Park water treatment plan. War two. Francis not here. Not here. Set, moved by Councillor Unica, seconded by Councillor Kovac. All in favor? Carried. And the report of the Waste Management Strategic Advisory Committee. Any questions, comments? Moved by Councillor Groves, seconded by Councillor Miles. All in favor? Carried. We have uh, one, two, three, five pieces of correspondence, uh, all from the deputy clerk. Do we want to move them all at once? Yeah, also move it. Uh, moved by Councilor uh, Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councilor. Do you want to see? <laughs> see, I was looking over there and looking at your hand. <laughs> okay, you're 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 going to be third on the list. Okay, all in favor? All five pieces of correspondence carried. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I believe everybody's in receipt of the, the governance task review report. And my understanding from that meeting is that this will go back to the municipalities for review. I, I believe that actually um, Peter is making a presentation or has to the city of Brampton. But tonight, I believe, yeah. And uh, the other two municipalities, this will go back for consideration and review by those, by your local municipality. Um, items related to uh, health. Um, yeah, Councillor Moore, if you chair this section, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, members of Council, the first item is a presentation. Welcome. It's on opi opioid use in the Peel context. Good morning, and thank you, Madam Chair. It's our pleasure uh, to present to you today on an update on opioid abuse, looking at it specifically from a region of Peel context. Uh, the majority of the presentation is really going to be done by my colleague, Dr. Kate Bingham. She's one of our Associate Medical Officers <laughs> of Health, who I don't believe you may have had the opportunity to meet. Uh, she has um, worked hard on this presentation and I think has some interesting facts here to uh, present before you. We'll let her present and we'll be happy to take any questions you may have in respect of this subject. So with that, I'm gonna Thanks. turn it over to you, Kate, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Dr. Davila, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us here to present. So we wanted to um, come to you proactively. Many of you may have uh, been following a lot of the media attention that has 
circulated recently around fentanyl um, and that being one component of sort of the larger issue of opioid abuse and overdose uh, in Canada and the fact that there has been a trend towards rising opioid overdoses and deaths uh, associated with opioid overdose in Canada. There's also been some recent activity in Toronto with the Toronto Board of Health uh, announcing that they are, will proceed with consultations around supervised injection sites in Toronto and that is certainly one component of a response to the increase in opioid deaths. This is really a chapter in a very long history in Canada of uh, a trend towards rising opioid addiction and overdose across the country. And there's been ongoing work in this area to address addiction and overdose both in public health but also in health services, mental health and at all levels of government. What we can tell you is that there's been a steady increase in prescriptions for opioids over the last 20 years and that this issue is one of both prescription addiction and abuse, uh, as well as illicit drugs that are in the opioid family, so drugs like, like heroin. And because, primarily because of the prescription trends, Canada is actually now the world's second largest consumer per capita of opioid uh, prescription drugs. And with this trend has been a parallel increase in opioid associated deaths, primarily due to accidental or unintentional overdose. What's striking about this is that many of these deaths like many other drug-related deaths, involve younger adults, and this results in many potential years of life lost from very productive or potentially productive members of our society. This is a graph showing the rate, the mortality rate, per 100,000 population of opioid-associated deaths in Ontario, and these are from the years of 1991 to 2010. And you can see a pretty obvious rising trend uh, across those two decades. And this really parallels the increase in uh, the number of opioid prescriptions that have been written um, across those years. You might, you might want to note that these data, they don't necessarily reflect a difference between uh, accidental and intentional overdoses. So these are from the Office of the Chief Coroner for Ontario. We do know that uh, for the for most populations, and Ontario included, the vast majority of these deaths are unintentional or, or undetermined. So at the time of the coroner's investigation, it wasn't clear whether it was an intentional overdose or not. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of overdoses are felt to be unintentional or undetermined. Giving it a little bit more local context, this is a graph showing opioid toxicity deaths in Peel, Toronto, and Ontario. So on the left-hand side uh, in the axis there is the deaths per 100,000 population. And across the bottom are the years 2010 through 2014. So the, most, the five most recent years of data that we could get from the Office of the Chief Coroner. The dashed line at the bottom is the rate for Peel. So it's only five years, so the numbers bounce around a little bit. And the, the numbers are, uh, the absolute numbers are reasonably low, although certainly concerning. Um, and above that, the dashed line are the numbers for Toronto. And then at the top there is the overall rate for Ontario. To give you a little bit more context, since the number of deaths per 100,000 population is a bit of a, uh, not a very useful concept, I think, for many people, although it, it has to account for the fact that population changes over time, which is why we give you a rate. But the range here is uh, between 20, a low of 20 deaths per year, to a high of 48 deaths per year, which you can see was the most recent year that we have complete data for, which is 2014. The 2015 data haven't been finalized. The Office of the Chief Coroner, the investigations take quite a long time, so the, the sort of final reports for these data do take some time to process. But the, the 2014 numbers, unfortunately, support this general increase in trend that you see. And the numbers of overall, of overall deaths have gone up. And there, if you look deeper into the data as to how, what drugs those have been related to, there certainly is a sense that fentanyl has been, been playing an increasing role in those deaths. I do want to go back, actually, if I can drive back there, um, to give you a, a little bit of further context. So we did ask for the, the 2014 data for a bit of comparison for motor vehicle collision deaths in Peel. Um, and so remembering that the opioid-associated deaths were 48 deaths in 2014, motor vehicle collisions, both pedestrian and car deaths, were actually only 44 deaths in 2014. So while we, we 
have tended in the past to think of that as being a leading cause of illness and injury and death for young young adults, young people in our population, uh, this is actually starting to overtake that, um, both as a response to, uh, both as a result of improved motor vehicle safety and road safety, but also because this is an increasing um, issue. So there's a number of ways to think about how we might address opioid abuse, and we've chosen a, a relatively simple framework here just to orient you to the lay of the land, really, um, and chosen to look at it through a lens uh, from our standpoint, around prevention, treatment, and harm reduction as three important components. In the realm of prevention, there's starting at the beginning with respect to physician training and professional education, teaching physicians about appropriate and responsible opioid prescribing, and how to monitor those patients who are taking opioids for uh, very legitimate reasons of pain management, and how to help them use them for the time that they are needed, and then hopefully transition to other medications or other therapies as appropriate. Supporting that are regulations and resources. So some of you may be aware that the prescribing re requirements for opioids have changed, um, requiring individuals to prevent, present identification in order to get a prescription medication filled for an opioid. Um, and that with that, the province has been able to start tracking those controlled substances and follow trends over time. There's also resources to support physicians and pharmacists in order to manage these drugs more responsibly. There have been changes and there are opportunities for changes to manufacturing processes. You may recall that the drug OxyContin was pulled from the market in 2012 because of how easy it was to abuse that formulation and it was replaced with a more difficult um, formulation to, uh, to inject or to alter. There's an important role for law enforcement and Canadian Border Services agents in terms of preventing the import of illicit drugs that are produced internationally and brought into the country. Many, much of the media attention recently has been around that component of the issue, um, as well as local law enforcement in terms of preventing the trafficking side of this. There's education at all levels, education of health professionals, education of the public, education of youth and students, um, and education of parents. And then there's the supporting mental health and wellness component that is really a large component of this. We know that uh, addiction overlaps heavily with the, our mental health and wellness and there needs to be a strong support um, and cooperation in that realm. While we like to look upstream, there's also an important component of treatment. So those who are struggling with opioid abuse um, and addiction need access to effective and accessible treatment services and mental health supports. And then there's the component of harm reduction. So harm reduction is a philosophical approach that aims to reduce any of the negative consequences of using drugs, recognizing that not, not everyone will be able or willing to stop using drugs altogether. And so it tries to minimize those harms associated with it. Specific with opioids, there's uh, the issue of injecting opioids. So some of these drugs, many of them can be injected. And there's very specific health-related harms associated with injecting, particularly around using or sharing um, injection equipment and the possibility of bloodborne infections being transmitted like HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So around opioid abuse, harm reduction strategies include providing needle exchange programs so that those who do inject drugs can use sterile, single-use needles and, not, uh, and reduce their risk of transmitting any bloodborne infections. <laughs> Some jurisdictions have provided supervised injection sites, so many of you will be familiar, of those, familiar with those in Vancouver, and obviously Toronto and some, several other jurisdictions in Canada are exploring that option. Um, and naloxone distribution. Naloxone is a medication that blocks the action of opioids and can be used in overdose situations to uh, prevent um, morbidity and mortality. And then along with that, is a parallel program of outreach and education. So there's specific interventions provided and then connecting individuals uh, who are using harm reduction services to treatment if they're interested, other health care and social services uh, that can help to mitigate some of the harms associated with using drugs. So currently Peel Public Health is, is engaged in this issue mostly around um, harm reduction activities. In accordance with the Ontario Public Health standards, we provide a needle exchange service, and that's the Peel Works Needle Exchange Program. So in partnership with our uh, local collaborators, there's a mobile van. 
their services through our public health clinics and through our community partners to provide safer uh, injection, safer and single-use injection equipment to those who do use injection drugs. Along with that, we do provide referrals and uh, in, engage our clients to connect them with other social and health services as needed um, and provide education around what we've become aware of and what what they often have become aware of in terms of specific dangers of new drugs that have come into uh, the realm of use, um, trying to help people engage in safer injection practices um, or, uh, or change their drug use altogether to try to mitigate some of the harms. <laughs> And along with this is the, there's a local network of information exchange with our local and provincial partners. So some of the next steps that we're planning to be involved in are to try to improve our understanding of local patterns of use. The ways in which and the patterns in which people use drugs are different in each jurisdiction. Um, and while we learn from each other, it's important to understand how it's unique to your own local situation in order to best provide for um, local, local citizens. We'd like to formalize our ability to have some improved local surveillance, and there's certainly work going on at the provincial and national level around opioid both use and overdose surveillance, how we can get better data about what drugs people are using and, uh, and how those drugs are impacting them. And then to enhance and hopefully formalize uh, some additional community partnerships um, and connect to broader opioid strategies with other jurisdictions and within the province and nationally. We'd be happy to, uh, to take questions as well as to come back at some point to update you on, on how we've made progress in these areas. Thank you very much, Dr. Bingham. You did Thank a you. great job. A couple of questions. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, on 10.1-7, with respect to outreach, I would... May I suggest that a good way of um, reaching some of this and getting some feedback on what you're looking for in terms of how many people are using this type of drug and that reaching out to the, the family physicians, I think they would be a good source of um, information for you in terms of providing that. Um, I know that we have a clinic in, in, in Bolton, uh, Addictions and Mental Health Clinic. You might want to reach out to, to those folks as well, to the doctors there. And I know there are several throughout the Peel region. They would have a lot of that information because, of course, they're treating a lot of these patients who have those types of addictions to what the drugs that you're talking about. So I just put that as a suggestion. Thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Yes, and if I can speak to that um, through you, Madam Chair, um, clearly the notion of enhancing community partnerships would absolutely include uh, health care providers, whether in primary care or in more specialized areas such as addictions and mental health. Mm -hmm. So um, I do see that as part of our strategy, okay. including not only the surveillance component, understanding who the users are, but also in respect of the solutions, how we might actually, you know, facilitate access to um, the various services that Dr. Bingham spoke to um, in her presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Starr. Yeah, you know, just um, just to go back to the chart there, uh, ten uh, point uh, one point five, where I think you mentioned uh, the average in two two thousand fourteen was uh, on the death part of it was four point eight. It's forty eight individuals. In Peel region. In Peel region. So the actual number of individuals who died of an opioid-associated overdose was 48 people in, in 2014. So would that be under the average for the province? In terms of a rate, so per in the population, it is under the average for the province, yes. You don't actually see the counts on the, the, the graph is showing the rate. I just provide the count to give some more meaningful context. Okay, so so yeah, so what I did just is if I looked at 4.8 or or say five, five times 1.3, that'd be uh, 65. Uh, that could be attributed to Peel, but that's not what it is, as an average. The in terms of the number it, who were who overdosed in the province as a whole in 2014, yes. I'm afraid I don't have that total number for you, but we could certainly get it for yeah, you. Yeah, it just appears that from the chart we're under that. We are under that yeah. the okay, provincial average. That's, yes. Thank you. Mayor Jeffrey. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I, this is a um, stark presentation. And I think the, the pieces, and this is very uh, clinical kind of presentation for us, mm -hmm. but I think of the families that are struggling with this. And I, uh, I guess my, 
my hope is that it doesn't stay clinical and that we find a way to reach out to a lot of families and parents that don't know how to help family members that are struggling with this or don't realize they have the addiction. I think that most addicts don't realize that it is a problem. And, and so I, my ask is, can we find a way to help parents know what to look for or something practical that way? Because I think there aren't that many family physicians that are equipped to have that conversation, so sometimes it has to come to the region. And I think the other thing, I wonder if you're uh, having conversations with pharmacists. I find my pharmacist is actually better than my family doctor in many cases, so I think that they would be a huge uh, group that, that is untapped and could be very, very helpful in helping us move forward on the strategy. Thank you. So if I can respond a little bit to that, Madam Chair. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly. This is not meant to be solely a clinical issue. Um, and if you think about the kinds of activities that we would be proposing um, to collaborate with partners on, um, we're talking about four major pillars, some of which are extremely clinical, such as treatment, some of which are more um, enforcement-based or police-based. There are enforcement activities that are clearly part of this as well. But I would argue that for us at Peel Public Health, the more important parts are those that are related to prevention, which clearly has a non-clinical aspect to it, and it does talk and speak largely to having parents, families, communities empowered to be able to have those early conversations so as to pre uh, prevent. Um, and harm reduction clearly has a, there is a clinical component to it, but there's also a, a non-clinical, much more holistic approach to it. And sorry, Kate, did you have something I you wanted, wanted to add? Through the chair, I wanted to add that the, I didn't speak to it in the presentation, obviously we had very limited time today, um, but there are some resources. So one thing is that the, the recently revamped health education within the schools mm -hmm. certainly does address drugs in general um, and education for students in particular around the risks of opioids and the risks of prescription drug use when you're using a prescription drug that is not prescribed for you. And that is one interesting facet of this issue that isn't necessarily the same for many of the other illicit drugs that we deal with um, in terms of, of trying to make an impact on drugs of abuse. A large component of this issue has been, has come up around the use and misuse of prescription drugs. Yeah. And I think one that came from a, a place of good intentions that has gone a bit awry, where at least at the time that I trained medically, there was a sense that uh, for a long time physicians had been under-treating pain, and that physicians weren't taking pain and chronic pain in particular seriously, that they weren't treating it effectively. Um, and the paradigm at the time was that opioid drugs, when used to treat pain in a responsible way, prescribed for that purpose and monitored, had a very low risk of dependency, addiction, and abuse. And I think, unfortunately, what we found is that that has not been the case. Um, and that f at least that component of the issue has uh, become one in which there's a scramble to try to swing the pendulum the other way um, and try to change that paradigm a little bit. And that starts, as I said, with, with some of the physician education, but obviously the public side too. Um, and patients understanding the risks and having those real discussions with their physicians being very informed. Um, the last thing I wanted to add is that there there are some resources and we certainly could do, do better to promote them um, around supporting parents and having these conversations with their, chil with their children, um, some of which are available on our Peel Public Health website, and we can circulate that to uh, councillors if they're interested in having that link directly. Thank you. Councillor Tovey. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, sorry I had to step out for a minute, but uh, this is a topic that interests me considerably. I have two methadone clinics in my ward. The first one opened up in my ward. We didn't know what to do. Um, we actually now have a licensing regime in place for methadone clinics. The second one that opened up was really interesting. He opened up because... The person who built, who built the first one in my ward was a former employee of his and he'd stolen some of his clients. So he decided to open one up two blocks away from the other guy. And <coughs> so we did quite a bit of research. And this is, this is like a, an epidemic, an absolute epidemic. And, and the, what, what, what I've discovered is that a lot of it comes from doctors themselves, over-prescribing to not just 
handing out Oxycontin like it was candy. And now they wind up on, on methadone for the rest of their lives. Then they go into this methadone treatment clinic where it, literally their business is to sell methadone. Um, do, a regular doctor can't prescribe methadone. It has to be done at this methadone clinic, which is absolutely ludicrous. So these guys have set up this, they, they literally have this great industry going. One guy owns over 20 clinics and they're just making money hand over fist. When a doctor would probably be the best, your family doctor would probably be, be the best person to, to be administering that for you. So I guess part of that, so part of you know, what you're saying, the prevention piece should, should be advocacy. And uh, I mean, I don't see any reason that these methadone clinics should even exist because really all they're doing is, in a sense, is promoting drugs. And so many of the people that I see walking through those doors, they're not, you know, junkies off the street. They're housewives. They're construction workers that used to have ba chronic bad backs. And, and they've just got addicted to mostly to Oxycontin and Oxycontin type o opiates just just literally through 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 the medical system. So. How do we, add, what's our advocacy position to, to the provincial government to try and get some legislation changed on this? Because I know in Peterborough, they had such a terrible, they had such a terrible experience in Peterborough because the doctors were getting free cruises if they hit a certain sales level of OxyContin. And if they hit that sales level, then they'd get a free cruise. They were taking these free cruises. They finally found out about it. They cut the whole thing off. And within six months, they had a heroin problem. Housewives were going down into alleys to buy heroin because they needed to get their fix. So what, what, what are we doing about the advocacy piece from, from, a, go, from a government point of view? Because that's a lot of that is just pure legislation. Respond. <laughs> you want to start with Go ahead. First? Well, I think Councillor Toby, I threw you, Madam Chair. Councillor Tovey, I think your, your um, comment and question all rolled into one highlights how very complex this particular situation is. Uh, and um, I think we have to be realistic about what we can do here as your local public health unit, which isn't to say that we're not active in uh, trying to make changes. Uh, there are groups uh, amongst the um, medical officers of health and the associate medical officers of health who are actually quite active in this arena. Um, urging the provincial government to uh, rethink some of its actions in respect of this uh, very important issue. Um, we are plugged into those networks and we are actively working with those who are seeking to solve this problem from the multiple prongs that are actually required. Everything from the way um, from the manufacturer side of things that um, you did miss, I'm not sure if you saw that component of Dr. Bingham's presentation, where prevention activities are everything from physician training to how the drugs are manufactured, how they're regulated. There's a whole gamut of activities. Um, to the extent that we're able to uh, bring our voice to that table, or the many tables that are there, we do that. Um, we do recognize that we are one local public health voice one local public health unit voice. So we, we um, recognize that we have only so much clout, but we also know that when we put the collective voice together, we are actually starting to gain some resonance. There is some activity happening at the provincial level. Um, I don't know yet. I think it may be too early to say at this stage of the game how quickly it's progressing and how effectively it's progressing, but we are continuing to put the pressure on. Mm -hmm. Well, I think just as a suggestion possibly for the future, if you could consider some, if, you're, if you do happen to see some legislation, like, you know, the, I think the methadone clinic's a, a pretty good example, um, then potentially maybe what you might want to do is put together a motion for us so that we can, we can advocate for this through the government relation committee. Because uh, so far, I mean, in five years, I haven't seen any of that. And I, I think that, you know, we're, we want to help you. So uh, if you could think of anything like that, uh, that we could take to our provincial and federal partners and just start to make them aware of the issues, uh, I personally, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Toby. That uh, we will definitely take up that offer if that's the will of council. And we'd be very happy as we start to work more formally with our community partners on this issue to come back to council to let you know what kind of progress we've made and what sorts of uh, issues or agenda items we would uh, benefit from you know, having your advocacy on, whether it's to the provincial or the federal government or to any other party. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if someone would like to move the chair, be heard. I will. 
You will you? Thank you. You're so kind. Um, just as a, another party to perhaps consult with is the benefit providers. Um, not just the pharmacists and the doctors, but there there may be some data that could be mined uh, through the benefit providers as well. Um, the the presentation today kind of um, I'm going to take some liberty. Uh, I've had a concern brought to my office recently around the proper disposal of used needles, and um, you know we send, tend to characterize the use of of um, of the needles, you know, as as folks who whether they're addicted to uh, addiction, and, and and the truth is that there are many people in our community who are uh, living with chronic conditions that require them to take a daily injection, whether it's diabetes or MS. There's arthritis treatments, uh, there's cancer treatments, and uh, many of the the public washrooms and office buildings, uh, sh shopping malls, do not have a safe needle disposal in the washrooms. And uh, I think it's a, it's a growing uh, issue. Uh, I think it's important to remove the stigma that's attached to, um, to the use of, uh, of needles. And so I'm wondering, I, I haven't prepared a motion, but I do think that um, uh, if you're agreeable to take direction from council, uh, to work uh, with the, our community stakeholders and report back to Council on a strategy to improve safe disposal options for needles um, and the related materials um, so that our community generally feels safer. And, um, you know, I don't know whether that's, I, I guess you're the best folks working with the stakeholders to decide or to recommend to Council you know, an incremental approach to it. But I, I think there's a role for government to take a leadership role. I know if you go into the airport uh, washrooms, they have them there. Um, I think sort of following along with that, there's a whole training component and so on. But, um, you know, whether it's an office building or a shop and shopping mall or another space that's used by the community, uh, it, it is just a wise approach. So if, you're, if you could take that as direction. Absolutely. Okay. Thank Would you. Would someone like to move receipt of the presentation? Councillor Groves, Councillor Pileschi, all in favour? That's carried. Uh, there's the report of the water, Community Water Fluoridation Committee. It's They're here for information. Councillor Tovey, Councillor Downey, all those in favour? That's carried. There are three items of communication, two for referral and one for a receipt, if they could be moved as a package. Councillor Gibson and K Mayor Jeffrey, all in favour? That's carried. And there are uh, three requests for uh, delegations at a future meeting. But that's that actually an, under other business. For Well, I was just going to do your job for well, you. You, you. know. Okay. So go, go, go for it. I, I apologize. I was just finishing off the page. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Um, actually, as stated by Councillor Moore, there's three items under <laughs> other business. Um, there's actually four. There's three related to uh, the requests to do a delegation before Council. And the reason they're here is because they don't relate to an item that will be on that agenda. So as per um, our uh, procedural bylaw to, to present at this meeting. So um, the first is a request uh, actually as an update to Regional Council on Partners in Green Project. So if Councillor Fonseca moves that and seconded by Councillor Innes, all in favour. And then there's two that are uh, a request with respect to um, cognitive disabilities since two residents that want to make a presentation. I'll move by Councillor Paris, seconded by Councillor Sato, all in favour of those. Carried. Oh, sorry, Councillor Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to suggest that the second two delegations be brought to the Health Services Integration Committee. Okay. Um, rather than coming yeah. back to this council, I had uh, a conversation earlier with um, the Commissioner of Health who thought that that might be a more logical place to track those. Do you want the presentations there or the request? The request, sorry. The request, the, the okay. request for, delegation. for the delegation. Have the delegations come to okay. the Health Services So you move that they be referred to that committee? Yes. All right. Seconded by Councillor Miles then. All in favour? Carried. Thank you for that. 
Um, and then 12.4, which is the fourth one, is uh, that okay. Councillor Down. That's okay. Oh, sorry, Councillor Sato. Well, I was just going to speak as chair of the committee that uh, that is being referred to, Mr. Chairman, that um, I've already met with staff, I've actually spoken with staff on it, and we had agreed that that's where it would be dealt with. So I appreciate Thanks. you bringing that forward. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, 12.4, though, then is uh, that Councillor Downey's resignation from the Growth Management Committee be accepted and that Councillor Ennis be appointed to the Growth Management Committee. Um, apparently, it's a conflict uh, um, with respect to Councillor Downey being uh, a member of the NEC and the board, the meetings conflict. So we go from one good rep to another good rep. And uh, Councillor Anika, you'll move that. And seconded by Councillor Gibson. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, do you want to be recorded in the minutes for that, or no? <laughs> yeah. The um, next item then is uh, by bylaws. I believe this is with respect to the tax capping policy. So, um, Mayor Crombie, if you'd move that. Second by Councillor Carlson. All in favor? Carried. Um, okay. Um, that moves us to. Uh, a recommendation with respect to in camera then moved by Councillor Sato, seconded by Councillor Parrish uh, in accordance with section 239 uh, of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended a motion was placed and was carried to move into closed session to consider the following uh, the first item is uh, with respect to the minutes of the tw April 28 2016 closed